Hi, everybody. It's Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Welcome to the weekend. Two great presentations for you today. Chip Zdarsky is coming in just a few minutes as far as the uploads go. But right now, I want to present Rick Green. Now, you may not know Rick Green unless you're a Canadian. If you're a Canadian, you probably very well know Rick Green. He's a wonderful comedian who, over the years, worked in sketch comedy with the Frantics in the 80s and the 90s. And then he was also one of the creative people, uh, both on camera and writing Red uh, Green, a fantastic Canadian uh, comedy show. Uh, If you've never seen it, think uh, Ron Swanson and other manly men uh, all hanging out and doing very manly things. Uh, Rick had an incredible show in uh, the very late 80s and uh, through the early 90s called uh, Prisoners of Gravity. Prisoners of Gravity was a public television show based out of Toronto where they spoke to science fiction greats, science fiction authors, and a lot of comic book people. And uh, Rick was able to interview such fantastic people as uh, Will Eisner and Jack Kirby, and uh, Neil Gaiman, and Frank Miller, and so many luminaries of the comic book business. And it's a fantastic time capsule of all of these creative people, and thankfully got to some of the great old-timers like uh, Ray Bradbury and uh, Will Eisner and Kirby while they were still uh, able to talk about their work. And uh, really uh, some incredible one-of-a-kind interviews over the years. These days, Rick is very involved as a public speaker of a, a medical condition known as ADHD, Adult Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. It's a disorder that includes a combination of persistent problems, paying attention, hyperactivity, impulsive behavior. Um, he has it and has learned to uh, cope with it uh, through medication and through uh, counseling. And uh, it's a big part of his life right now. It's a very worthy um pursuit, especially as he says, a lot of people right now that are likely first responders probably suffer from it as well. And uh, it's it's fascinating. And really, I'm glad that it was part of our conversation. Um, But uh, really, uh, Rick has had an incredible career. And we talk a bit about it, mostly though about Prisoners of Gravity on this very interesting episode of Word Balloon. I really think you'll enjoy it. Uh, All brought to you by my buddies, the League of Word Balloon listeners. Uh, great support that I get from them via Patreon. Their subscriptions each month, patreon.com slash word balloon. If you like Word Balloon, do you think it's worth a dollar a month to you? Is it worth the price of a comic book a month to you? If you like it, if you can swing it, because I know we are in crazy near depression like financial times and I'm right there with you on the unemployment line and that's why I greatly appreciate the support through their sponsors sponsorship the League of Word Balloon listeners Word Balloon is brought to you by alexrossart.com Alex is a good friend of the show and uh, I am uh, honored that uh, he aligns himself with Word Balloon and uh, good lord we all love his iconic art uh, whether it's for DC Marvel Things like Monty Python, The Monkees, David Bowie, so many other great uh, licensed things, The Beatles. Uh, If you go to alexrossart.com, you will find great value for your dollar, whether you can uh, spring for uh, something like uh, original cover art or uh, pages to lithos and posters, every price point you can imagine, you will find something and a beautiful image from alexrossart.com. Coming to Kickstarter from the mind of Franco, the man behind Teen Titans Go to the Library, Faye of the Moon, and All Yeah Comics, comes the new LXT, the adversarial fighting card game, live now on Kickstarter. LXT, Lux vs. Tenebris. Imagine a loved one has been spirited away to a land of terror and torture. Would you be willing to go after them and fight through a horde of acolytes of the Dark One just to get them back? Developed as a role-playing card game that can be played multiple ways. The cards will have full-color illustrations on the front and chock-full of stamps and moves on the back. You can also get the LXT Who's Who book with origin stories and information about all the characters. Still want more? Also available is the LXT Dark Atlas book, filled with prose stories about all the baddies and illustrations from a wide selection of comic artists. There are plenty of add-ons you could purchase separately like comic books, stickers, original art from the game, and more. It's going to be a howling good time. LXT, live, now on Kickstarter. All right, let's get into it now. A really interesting conversation about the genesis behind one of the best comic book television shows ever. And how many comic book television shows have there been? You could likely count them on one or two hands. 
and truly prisoners of gravity is one of the best there are examples of it on youtube i highly recommend you check them out after you hear this wonderful conversation with me and one of the creators rick green on today's word balloon commander green it's commander rick everybody rick green welcome to word balloon it looks like you've uh tricked out the satellite to uh, resemble a normal office these days. Yeah, exactly. I thought, you know what, I've, I've made the uh, the Reality One satellite more of a home. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, man, seriously, uh, Prisoners of Gravity was an amazing show that, sadly, here in the States, I missed. But thank God for YouTube, man. And were you putting those uh, up yourself, or uh, who, who was putting up the videos for you? I don't know who's doing it. Um, so somebody is, um, my goal is to actually get a bunch of them up because uh, then uh, we can actually, um, you know, uh, put in something new to explain what you're seeing and set some context, maybe some background, uh, add some where are they now and things like that. So that's that's possibly happening. We're waiting. Uh, it's just a matter of finding the time. So, yeah. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to hear that, man. And I, and I do want to get into, you know, what you're doing now. Right production company and stuff but if you would yeah. boy, absolutely man no great cause and honestly no i'm glad that you're out there helping people with it um yeah. but back to prisoners of gravity like give me the origin story i mean this is a comic book show so <laughs> let tell us tell us how it started well there um so it was aired on tv ontario which is kind of the pbs of the province um and you know with eight million people in the provinces they had back in the day uh quite a, a good budget. They were a world leader in children programming and a number of other things. And of course, successive cutbacks have kind of uh, put an end to that. But I happened to go in there uh, with a couple of proposals, one for a couple for science shows and one for a kid's show, and was told that I've come to the wrong department and that I need to go and talk to uh, science and children's. And this was the arts department. Okay. And then I think the next day I got a phone call uh, from the head of the arts programming who said, um, I have a fellow here who, named Mark Asquith. I went, yeah, I play ball hockey with him every Sunday. He said, yes, he seems to know you too. And we're wondering um, if you'd be interested in coming in and just auditioning. We need someone to be on camera to host eight minutes, just talking about what the latest releases are, what's going on in the world of, of science fiction and comic books and so on. And it would run in between two episodes of Doctor Who because there's no commercials. So there'd be whatever, 24 minutes and then eight minutes and then 24 minutes of the next episode of Doctor Who. <coughs> Excuse me. So I said, sure. I'm not going to say no to work. And... Uh, <laughs> I asked, what do you want me to do? He said, oh, just talk about a book you've read or something. So I uh, pulled out the last book, science fiction book I read. I was out of the loop on comics for a while. So I wasn't. Sh so I ran to the corner store and grabbed one, I think, and then came back and just wrote up an audition piece, went in a day or two later, down in the studio, camera set up, and I went off to the races. And it started with me saying, yep, well, what had happened is I had realized, okay, they want me to talk about stuff, but I don't want to be sitting in front of a bunch of books with a pipe. It's just not going to work, right? <laughs> so I'm a writer, an actor, a comedian, and I wanted to add a twist to it. But I also saw it, I think, right from the beginning as an opportunity to address big issues, um, that it wouldn't be a book show. It really would be um, a show about what matters the, and even back then it was the environment it, you know war and violence and so on but also getting into things about you know uh suggestions on how to become a comic artist or what uh, what and so on all of that as well but the framework was going to be that in my mind and so i came in with this idea of being up in space that i had tried to flee planet earth and then crashed into this satellite what are the odds and now since i can't f flee them i'm going to have to save them um, and so we're going to talk about what matters. And, and the only people who are doing that are people who are creating science fiction and comic books and speculative fiction. And the whole thing was, you know, greetings, prisoners of gravity. Or, greetings, earthlings, all you prisoners of gravity. This is Commander Rick, 22,000 kilometers straight up as the crow flies, but only if the crow's got a big mothering 
rocket pack on his back and <laughs> off I went. So they were thrilled. They said, you're hired. Okay. Um, and Mark was going to be the encyclopedia and I was going to be the face and the, add the humor and the twist and link it together somehow uh, with all the material. And the, what happened is then the network uh, at this point, and this would have been 1989, the, all these specialty channels were coming along and suddenly somebody, one of the other channels bought Doctor Who. They lost the rights to it. So now it was like, well, what are you going to do? And we were probably two months into pre-production and getting it organized. And at that point, we made the argument, Mark Asquith and I both made the argument that, look, there's enough here. There's, you know, there's 400 comics a month coming out or whatever. There's, you know, 60 novels and... Yeah. Uh, and so on. So there's tons for us to deal with here. And we could go a half hour. They found the money and we were off to the races. Um, the first year we had a um, somebody in charge who was uh, just didn't get the show. And so that first season was kind of a waste. And it was, it was, in, I don't know if I'd say insulting to the material, but I think it was in a way. I mean, it's certainly when I would go to the uh, spaced out library, which is in Toronto to do research and get information, they were welcoming me. And then after the first episode or two aired, it was like, yeah, it's over there. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and poor Mark who lived in this world, um, he knows everybody, right? He just, even back then he was the one. Uh, and I think, um, uh, I would say a lot of people would credit their success. A phone always, phone was always ringing with people saying, Mark, I just got a job penciling Spider-Man. What should I charge? And uh, Neil Gaiman uh, was just starting out at that point. And through the Silver Snail, which was the comic store that um, Mark was managing mm -hmm. uh, before all this. Uh, so he knew him. And, and just recently, Neil told him that uh, he credits Toronto with being the place where that made him and that that, broke those through. first appearances. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, so off it goes and we get through the first season. It's awful. And we said, you know, we, who'd you, we have to... who'd you have on in that first season? Curious. I'm curious. Uh, I couldn't even tell you. We, okay. we, we had a few guests. Uh, I mean, I know Rob Sawyer who lived locally. There were a number of, you know, uh, authors, in town, there were occasionally, they actually, TV Ontario had its own book show called The Imprint. So sometimes we'd tag along with that. I think we may have done interviews if an author was coming through town. Okay. Um, but the show was just weird. It was just, uh, it was unwatchable. Um, Jeez. Anyway, at the end, we got, a, at the end of the season, we both said, we're not doing this anymore. And, and unless there's changes, and there was a change. And in came uh, Greg, Thurlbeck, who was background was at uh, Much Music, which is Canada's MTV. Okay. And they were, um, I have yet to hear anyone who watched Much Music and then watched MTV who didn't say, wow, Much Music is way better. Um, oh, man. See, I'm yeah. not surprised. All right, go on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, now, this was back when it was music and stuff, but it was cutting edge, the stuff they were doing. Anyway, uh, so Greg was an editor background and he came in and he said, I don't understand why the opening credits and why is that there? And it's like, Oh yeah, we didn't understand that either. And so, um, in a, a long series of conversations, we were joined then by, uh, a woman, uh, who was working on one of the other shows there who kept saying, I have a question about this. And eventually it was like, you got to work for us. Uh, <laughs> cause she had great questions. And that's Shirley Brady, who okay. whose father actually owned a bookstore. And um, so, yeah, so we kind of hashed it out. We realized, you know, that we were going to pick a, um, a topic each week and focus on it. And that meant collecting a lot of interviews. So if the theme was the city or the theme was time travel or whatever, you needed to have enough interviews. And by the third and fourth season, we were able... We w Mark had built up, uh, Mark and Greg and Shirley had built up a library of interviews where they were able to ask questions uh, specifically for uh, uh, upcoming episodes. And we would end up with probably 40 topics that we were working on at any one time. And some of them repeated violence and uh, a few of the other ones did come back a couple of times. Uh, but it was really... Um, 
interesting to be able to then go to uh, one of the uh, comic or the um, science fiction award shows or at the conventions. And Mark would be able to talk to uh, Harlan Ellison and, and on and on and on, all of these authors, uh, uh, many of whom are no longer with us. And in fact, when Jack Kirby died, um, CNN contacted us because we had the only interview with him on video. Wow. Was, yeah, astounding. Uh, and it was an amazing interview. Separate, yes. Separate yes. story, though. So, and so Mark and Greg and Shirley really built the spine of the show and then left it to me to make it funny and entertaining and, and deliver it. And in the meantime, while they were doing that over the summer, uh, I was off doing the Red Green show. So I was writing. Oh, uh, sure. So I'm doing both. So I'm on the Red Green wow. show. I'm writing. I'm for some seasons, I was actually directing and performing. And at the same time, I was hosting and writing uh, Prisoners of Gravity. And the joke is that people who loved the Red Green Show had never heard of Prisoners of Gravity. And the people who'd heard of Prisoners, who were avid Prisoners of Gravity fans went, ooh, because they thought Red Green Show was hee haw. It was actually, it was actually a very clever show. It was a really, um, um, yeah. it's, it's um, somebody said it's, he said, there's no show on television that is harder on men than the Red Green Show. <laughs> and uh, a, woman, a woman professor actually wrote and said, never have women on the show because we know how you'll behave when we're around. <laughs> so, it's just like, it's, so, yeah, so, the, so I was doing both at the same time, which was just, wow. it was in, yeah, it was nuts. Yeah. Uh, and Prisoner of Gravity ran five seasons, four of which are, are watchable. I don't know how many episodes there are that are. It's 80 or 70 or 80. Um, Total. Yeah. Holy yeah, there, yeah, well, there's a ton. Um, oh and in gosh. fact, one of my favorite things is we did an episode about ecology and then submitted it. Somebody at TVO submitted it to the uh, Ecological Video Awards or, some, or it's, I don't know, some awards thing. Sure. And it won. We won a silver medal. I think it was the New York festivals. And then there were calls coming in people who'd seen that one episode and said, we'd like to buy your, uh, see more of your ecological series. Uh, there's a gravity because you covered it in a way nobody has. And it was, you really said, it was like, yeah, that, that was one episode. And, and that, I think that was what made it like, even my mom could sit and watch it and go I had no idea because you had all these brilliant people. Occasionally there were scientists uh, who'd come out with the latest book on fractals or whatever was breaking at that point. So there were popular uh, uh, book, books on science, but fantasy was just starting. Well, actually, I mean, Harry Potter and, and Lord of the Rings hadn't broken yet. As, as, in fact, I'm sure I doubt uh, Harry Potter had even been written at that point, but so it really was mostly speculative fiction. We did some horror, um, and, which wasn't my favorite. It's not my favorite genre, I have to say. I, you know, my life's scary enough. I don't need to, because I just end up thinking about that. And uh, anyway, <laughs> and going, yeah, what if that happens? Um, so yeah, so anyway, yeah. So that five years we went, and uh, it was great. I mean, we just, I think there were three hundred interviews that they did. That's with amazing. legendary names, um, you know, you can open the encyclopedia of uh, science fiction. It's about this thick, and it's uh, it is amazing. About every every third page, yep, yep. <laughs> and and um, the book was written after we're, uh, after the show ended, I think. But it, you know, it because it mentions the show as one of the things. But they the That's same crazy. thing. They had topics in there, cities and and uh, you know vampires and whatever. So yeah, and so off it went, and it it um, to me it was a lesson in niche programming because um, totally, you know, if Nancy Cress, science fiction author, was on a local uh, morning show promoting her new book, the interviewer probably hasn't read the book. Somebody's read it through, or at least read yep. the cover, and so our next guest writes about giant planets <laughs> even though she's from here in town now what is it about these gi whereas whereas when mark i did a few of the interviews not many okay uh, but uh so that was interesting because the guests had to be told don't call me 
Mark or Greg or Shirley call me Rick. Right. They had to right. match, right? Right. <laughs> the only one who had trouble with that was Ray Bradbury, who kept saying, because he was interviewed by Shirley, and he'd say, now, young lady, and <laughs> a young lady like yourself, and like, you know, if you're going to cut around. You'll notice that when you watch the episodes, there's a lot of cutting between me looking at the monitor, talk, Nancy coming up, and then over my shoulder, and then full screen of the guest, because... We interviewed people who are authors who may not be um, as eloquent uh, in spo when speaking. And at the other issue is, um, unlike with Nancy Kress being interviewed by Good Morning Cincinnati, uh, this was, the questions were really deep. You know, yes. in this book, yes. you say this. And I remember being, asking some of the questions and the author, and I've forgotten who it was now, but he just, that's, that's, 15 years ago, I have no idea, which I now appreciate. Um, and they took a while to answer, but it, you, um, and so the upside was we had quotes on any topic from 15 to 20 people. The downside was um, when we interviewed Jack Kirby, the tribute episode didn't, wasn't the first up. So, uh, and there were a few people like that, that we, you know, big names and they would first appear with one 40 second quote in another episode about cover art or um, time travel or whatever it would be. And then the emails would come in. How dare you only give Jack Kirby 30 seconds? How dare you? Oh, you know, why did it all want? It's like, wait, wait, it's coming. It's coming. And so, yeah. So we had the, uh, we did the um, tribute episode and Mark had um, recorded it at uh, the big comic Con, I guess one in New York that year. Maybe it was out in California. Anyway, he, uh, Jack was, you know, uh, not all there anymore. Uh, and his wife had said, uh, you know, I don't know if he'll be of any, you know, if he'll be helpful, whatever, if he'll be no to have a coherent answer. Yeah, yeah. So they sat down and he was quite frail. And Mark is sitting there with this, you know, this hero across from him and he goes, what did you try to, uh, what did you try and embody in your artwork? Something like that. And Jack Kirby just went, I really, and away went. And Mark went, well, that was good, you know, thinking, and then asked the next question. And the next question, and who was, was it the Hulk or the Thing? He said, who was, did that represent? Jack, or uh, Mark knew, of course, with Jack. That was me, the da 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 the little guy who would transform and so on. So, uh, and at one point, Mark looked over at Jack's wife, and she's sitting here, tears pouring down her face, yeah. and she's just, she can't believe it. And Mark is trying not to choke up. And at about, I guess, about the 25-minute mark, Jack just started to fade, oh, and Mark very quickly wrapped it up and, and thanked him and so on. And so when the episode was put together and we sent it down, sent them a copy, uh, he was thrilled. That's great. And, uh, his wife was as well. So, yeah. so it was interesting because we were taking a, a number of genres that were outlaw, that were not respected and really yep. um, adding some depth. I mean, it's changed right now, you know, sure. watching Handmaid's Tale and, and so on. But, yeah. uh, and, you only have to look at the uh, list of the top money-making films for the last 15 years. And you got it. Yeah. No, it's the, no, you're right. You gave respectability to this outlaw medium and several outlaw mediums really. And that's, that's great. And thank God you did Mark get to talk to, or pardon me. You say I'm doing it now. Yeah. Shirley, thank you for doing that. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, Rick, honestly, you got to uh, capture these people. I'm stating the obvious, but for people uh, maybe watching and listening, you know, you got these wonderful people and, and they told their story in forms that they normally didn't get and certainly not in big media like television. Because no you're right, it would only be three to five minutes on the Good Morning Show and they'd have no idea who they were talking to. So I'm sure they were thrilled to be able to express their ideas in your forum. And it's it's a time capsule. It's a wonderful time capsule capturing these people at their strength, at their full potential when they were young or, you know, people like Bradbury and Kirby and stuff that yeah. uh, were, you know, were older, but again, had this great body of work that they could speak of. So that's, that's incredible. And also that, um, 
I think Adam, you, you predate Mystery Science Theater 3000. I don't know about that. Oh, well, I, what, what years were you doing Prisoners of Gravity, man? 89 to 95. I think so. I kind of okay. think so. I mean, again, I, I'll, I'll, you know, yeah. I just had I just had uh, Frank Conifon from uh, Mystery Science Theater. And yeah, I know they were doing it locally in, in Minnesota, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. But That'd regardless, it seems like you were certainly in on it early enough and during a great period when not you know again only not only speculative fiction but you know comics in general weren't really seeing respectability and and you were giving it yeah so i think that meant that the people we interviewed were a little cautious uh, less so in the comic field because mark everybody knew mark um and he in running the comic shop had built silver snail into a huge uh, Great store. success and so Absolutely. on so yeah Great story yes yeah so it, there was that um but I know with the authors, like uh, there's one author, I won't say who, but a well-known author who won't, would refuse to be interviewed because he said, I won't appear with a costumed host. And <laughs> it was like, well, it's not really Vampirella, but okay. Uh, and I understand. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing was, the other thing that happened though was very quickly, um, you know, everybody was, well, uh, if I have some time, I'll, you know, I'm here for the award and so on. And just to socialize with friends, but then somebody we'd interviewed from the pre, you know, in that first season or two, will go, oh no, these guys get it right. They've read your book. They're awesome. Do the interview. Well, all right. And so the authors that we interviewed, the artists that we interviewed, and occasionally film people or actors, um, then yeah, those people became our biggest uh, supporters. And when they were coming through town, was wonderful. They would they would uh, jump on board uh, and and stop by, and then we were able to also piggyback onto the bigger budget show imprint. Um, so when uh, that was the book show, I'm assuming. Yeah, that was their sort of standard classic book show. Three hosts yes. or two or three hosts, and okay. very okay. very educational television. Uh, fairly straight, clever sometimes, but you know it wasn't it wasn't a a guy up in space. Right. Uh, um, but the uh, Salman Rushdie was in town. And I wow. think at that point he was just, he was traveling around despite the whatever fatwa or whatever yes, was yes. on his head. Yes. And so we asked some, we got some questions to ask. For example, we asked questions there or uh, Margaret Atwood would, and we'd sure. ask, we have a bunch of our questions asked. So we got not only the people we interviewed, uh, but the people who who the bigger shows were getting. And here's what's interesting. I mentioned this earlier. I'm wandering a bit. Did I mention all this? All um, it's all good. Uh, but yeah, the, um, what was I saying? The, the uh, shit, I've lost it here. No worries, man. Well, we could edit. Uh, but yeah, you were talking about just, you know, getting uh, maybe bigger people that maybe weren't, uh, you know, they're going on imprint and they weren't, uh, they were uh, right. big, bigger artists or bigger authors and stuff. So I, I can pick it up. So, all right, man. So, but here's the, was the lesson that I took away. And it was a few years before it kind of struck me, but we were actually getting better ratings than the bigger show that had the uh, higher profile host and higher profile <laughs> guest, And we were getting much bigger ratings, even though we were focused on one small area of literature. And I thought about it and I realized if you love detective stories, you're tuning into their imprint every six weeks when there's, oh, P.D. James is on or whoever. Sure. sure. And in between, you know, Margaret Atwood, she, has she written a mystery? Not interested. And so on. Right. Whereas we were giving you, first of all, we were giving uh, access to people who were talking about exactly what it is you wanted to hear. We were, And the viewers, I can tell you, I can't tell you how many times People said you expanded my horizon. I thought I was the only one because if you're living in a small town, and the only comics are available, at the, you know, back then at the corner store, sure, and it was Archie and Richie Rich. You bet. Yep. Um, so there were all these people who have since told me, you know, you saved my teens, you saved my childhood, or whatever. I believe. It. I believe but, it. but the niche um, market, it was like we are giving people an insight into something that nobody else could afford to do really. And it was all kind of by accident. Now a days, nowadays, of course, it's, you know, look at us right now. Right. It's all about niche programming. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah Absolutely. So, yeah. And the danger is you get, you can get cut off. So if you're someone's only dealing with one of the advantages or strengths that I think we brought to it was if we were talking about 
nighttime in the city, we could talk about a comic book and show visuals. We could talk about um, a science fiction story, uh, you know, a Philip K. Dick book or whatever. And, and we could do a horror story and we could do a fantasy. Like we could tie these. And it was up to me as the, uh, the link to pro figure out how to link all these things together. Um, although I was, you know, often given here's some background information and maybe you can link these two ideas. I was like, but yeah, it was a, it was fun to do. It was an interesting uh, and very satisfying to puzzle piece these things together and see it add up to, you know, more than some of the parts or the sum is more, more than the sum, whatever, you know what I mean. Discovering it on YouTube truly, I, I became incredibly jealous. I remember in the late 90s, the Anti-Gravity Room, the kids show for comics, that was a really good show as well. And, this, and our sci-fi channel picked it up. So I was able to see that, you know, 20 plus years ago. But I got to tell you, man, no, it's it's fantastic. And please, I hope you will make time because I know how busy you are with uh, <laughs> with your current you know projects and everything. And then, you know, so, yeah, let's let's talk about what you're doing these days. But also, by the way, hats off for being part of Red Green, too, because uh, honestly, I, and I and I swear to you, man, because I, I, I think sometimes Americans are like, yeah, they don't really think about Canada. Canadian comedy is that was always my little secret as a teenager loving uh, SCTV and uh, even getting to to meet a couple of the people, a couple of uh, uh, you know uh, cast members, and also kids in the hall. When I was in college, yep. I loved the kids in the hall. Yeah. And, and good lord, Ken Finkelman, I just think is a comedic genius. And Red yeah. Green was another one of those shows. These great subversive kind of comedies and stuff. So yeah, and low awesome. budget, low budget, and partly because it's low budget, we didn't have a network saying you've got to add women. That the, we didn't have a network saying there's no such thing as a show. Where the host has a beard, it's like yeah, that's what we're having. Um, he's not shaven, and you know, it's so. There's flying under the radar. It's a little. It is in its own way. Canadians can get away with being a little more um, underground or a little more, a little edgier, and so on for sure. What's interesting about the anti gravity room is that Mark was asked to work on that because it was inspired by what we done, we had done, and we had said to them, well, why don't we move this over? but it was made for a kids network and the host had to be under 16. Sure. So it was like, okay, that ain't gonna work. Um, and I was, I had then gone on and was doing another, I created another series called History Bites, which you can find on uh, YouTube, History Bites Official. I'll look for that. I'll look for and that. It's, um, it's hard to explain. It's, we pick a day in history and we go channel surfing. So the main story might be the death of Julius Caesar and it's Nightline with Ted Koppel interviewing uh, Oliver Stonis, the Greek playwright, who is a conspiracy theory that this was not this was not a vast government conspiracy. It was a lone knife man. Uh, how could we get all these senators together to commit murder? These are senators, you know, and it was like so oh, the there. play off of the whole JFK and so sure, on. Sure. And then it would go channel surfing and there'd be Martha Stewart, you know, when I'm hosting an orgy, I'd like to arrange the triclin and then click the channel would change is the ADHD, right? Then the channel would change. Yeah, him. he's a tough kid. I like this guy. He's an up and comer on the, the sports guy, right? A tough kid. He's got that uh, short sword and the net. I don't know what that's for. He's supposed to be a fisherman. Oh yeah. Well, anyway, I like this guy. He's, he's uh, my kind of gladiator. He's from Thrace. A lot of tough, and so on. So awesome, you know. And then history be bites, for, yeah, yeah, history bites, and it, yeah. And then we would go into a, an ad for Roman toilet paper. And the, <laughs> inter the interesting thing is, you could find a hundred books about the death of Julius Caesar, but try looking up. And this was when the internet was still young. Try looking up what Romans used for toilet paper. Sure. And, <laughs> and it's like, well, they didn't have paper. I know that. Uh, what did they use? And so, so to try and find that reading, like the number of books we went through, there was, uh, I had six young writers or five young writers working with me. It was great fun. It was a learning experience. The cast were amazing. Um, people came in when we did our Letterman thing, uh, Ron Pardo plays uh, David Letterman. Okay. People walked it past the edit suite and thought, oh, Letterman's on. <laughs> and the set was just, it looked great. But if you look carefully, it was just, Anyway, so yeah, low budget, but then, and then I guess about a decade ago, a little over, um, my co-producer slash editor slash wife and I uh, created a documentary about ADHD because I'd been diagnosed back in 2000 and encountered nothing but dismissal and uh, denial so, and so on. 
break break down for us the letters because I'm assuming it's attention deficit, but the HD part. Help me out. So attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and not everybody has the um, everybody has the attention, but it's not necessarily a deficit. So we can hyperfocus. Uh, and that's why parents will say he can't have ADHD. He spends hours on his games. He can focus just fine when he's playing with his trains yep. or she's, uh, it's like, yeah. And try taking it, that controller away and watch what happens. It's then a physical reaction. So it's uneven attention um, is a much better way of calling it. This is a terrible name for it. Anyway, wow. and then the hyperactivity, um, a lot of girls don't show that. My son certainly didn't. And that's how I found out. Uh, my son was diagnosed, and then it was like, oh, let me see this list of symptoms. Well, this is just normal, isn't it? No. Uh, it's normal for you because this is driven by genes. It's, and since we did the documentary, they're now up to, I think, 105 different suspect genes have been identified that show wow. up in people with ADHD. Not everybody has them all. Some of them also show up in obsessive compulsive and, uh, and other things, Asperger's and so on. And what's interesting is they're all really the same. They fall under a category, which I do like the name of, which is executive function disorder. And what that means is, or the way I describe it when I'm giving a talk about this, is uh, think about the executives at a car company. You may have the same workers, but if the executives are uh, really good at what they do, you're going to have the right color door arrive there. You're going to have the cheapest door. They're going to monitor how much it's cost, expenses, making sure every tracking everything, remembering everything, organizing everything, following through, doing the same thing over and over and over and over. And that's not us. The If you have a company with poor executive function, so it's not the executives aren't managing it well aren't organizing it well, aren't keeping track of things, aren't remembering, then you're going to end up with a car company that's in real trouble. Sure. And so what we're good at is uh, folks with ADHD, and there are probably, a, let's say by adulthood, some kids grow out of it by adults, one in 25, one in 23. Um, you know, there are some very successful people with this disorder. And there are ways to make it work for you. For example, having written 700 episodes of radio and television, <laughs> yeah. but only finished one screenplay because the screenplay takes three to six months. And there's no way I'm going to sit there that long. I could write five scenes for the Red Green Show in a day. I'll go do that. So th it's what I discovered was there were things I did really well, things I didn't do all that well. And this gave me the explanation of why I was calmer on stage in front of 500 people than if I had to sit down and read a two-page contract to appear in front of 500 people. Um, so you'll find us in the military. You call 911. You're getting a lot of adults with ADHD showing up. Uh, emergency room. Every time I talk to anybody who's an emergency room staff or doctor or, what, or nurse or whatever, they're all, yeah, I got my son's diagnosed. I think I have it. Or, yeah, I was diagnosed or whatever. So... It's everywhere, and it's um, it's so I don't know what the word is treatable. There's so much you can do to turn it around, um, and it sabotages you in a thousand ways. And and so we made this documentary called ADD and Loving It question mark exclamation mark. And the point was to get people who thought ADHD was a joke or some pharmaceutical uh, plot, sure, to actually yes. tune in and go loving it. Um, and they knew they knew. So the people who had ADHD said, how dare you say loving it? This, you know, you're struggling with two to four times the rate of divorce, of car accidents, of bankruptcy, of falling out of school. You, it takes any over 10 years off of your life on average. Wow. It cuts your, oh, it's the undiagnosed and untreated. It's brutal. Diagnosed and treated, you know, Richard Branson. Uh, Interesting. It, yeah. Oh, uh, but not surprising. Yeah. Go athletes, on. Uh, the guy who started Kinko's and who, but somebody with ADHD is going to say, you know what? I bet a lot of people at three in the morning realize they need 600 copies of a 50 page color report <laughs> by eight in the morning for a meeting or they're fired. And any sensible business person is going to go, who would be, who would leave it that late? Who would procrastinate that much? He would have. Uh, so, right. And uh, so yeah. the fall or failure, I think is his name. It came up with Kinko's and, and it was a success. Um, so yeah, athletes and uh, military, 
uh, so many different fields where we can do really well, sales and so on. But as they say, not everybody uh, displays the hyperactivity, the kind of um, the chattering like I do. Um, some are very quiet. It's all good. Don't kid yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And the girls, you know, it, it tends to be, well, there's arguments about whether this is just socializing, but girls tend to be missed because they tend to be quiet. And so they're in the corner of the room imagining the next Harry Potter series. And the teacher says, all right, get out your crayons and draw a picture of a giraffe using only three colors. And they're like, mm -hmm. well, there's not a noise and activity. Yeah. Oh, everybody's getting out there. So she gets out seven crayons and she starts drawing. And then and the teacher looks at what she's done or she puts up her hand. Uh, can I draw? A I'm going to draw a house. No, no. Did you, you know, like, is this girl stupid? And so anyway, uh, and as much fun as it's been to do all of the comedy over the years, this was a, um, what happened is almost immediately emails started arriving saying, you just saved my life. Um, like uh, some people had bought pills to kill themselves. One guy had, and he said, I flushed those down the toilet, but he was on, he said, I'm on my third uh, divorce and fourth bankruptcy. And when the paperwork was done in two weeks, I was out of here because I couldn't figure out life. And I happened to catch your program. And it's a comedy because it's Patrick McKenna, who, who is not a comedy, but it's a Patrick McKenna who played Harold on the Red Green Show getting diagnosed. And his wife's actually the star, I think. But anyway, uh, and so she, he saw this and went to his doctor. He said, I was pounding on his door the next morning and I got a di very different set of pills and everything changed. Um, he found something that worked and bang. Uh, and he, so that, I mean, I've won the Order of Canada and the Order of Ontario That's and great. all kinds of acclamation and all kinds of stuff, but it's, it's still going strong. So we created a website, uh, totallyadd.com uh, and Totally ADD is, and there's a YouTube channel with, I don't know, a hundred and something videos. We have a shop on the website with, uh, I could go on, I think 16 videos on everything from sleep to uh, anger, to emotion, to careers, to, and so on and so on and so on. So yeah, it's been, uh, it's been astonishing. Um, and like, you know, my career path is, I was with a comedy troupe called the Frantics. Um, and then I I the Frantics, like, that's awesome. I didn't know you were in the Frantics. That's amazing. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, so we got we got uh, canceled, and so the next year along came the kids in the hall. But they used to come and watch us and sit there. And sure, I wrote right. So yeah, so the Frantics, and then the Red Green Show at the same time as Prisoners of Gravity, and then History Bites and the Red Green Show, and then ADHD, and that was one hour that followed up with a sequel. They're still running on occasionally on PBS, uh, with a yes. run it late at night as a, a pledge program. But yeah, so it's been. Uh, it's been interesting. Wow. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Rick, honestly, I'm so glad that you've, you know, found this about yourself and really have been able to help people. That's incredible. And I know you also do a lot of public speaking as well. Yeah. Um, I, I saw your website and uh, God, no, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm glad. And yeah, isn't it, it is interesting how life will take you in different turns and yeah, clearly going from comedy writing uh, to, to what you're doing now, that's, that's amazing. Are you still comedy writing at all? Do you, well, do you have time for it? Um, not for anyone else. I mean, the, the stuff on the website and the rants and stuff I do in the blogs, there's still a lot of humor in them. But there's, sure. you know, there's some heartbreak stuff in there as well uh, in sharing. Um, but I haven't done much. For, uh, I haven't done much for anyone else. I haven't had time. I've been busy with this. Um, and as you said, doing a lot of talking. I mean, I spoke to the paramedics association because again, uh, you know, the analogy I use is if you have ADHD, your brain is low or lower than, than most on, you have very little dopamine and norepinephrine, two of the transmitters. And you probably heard of serotonin, the happy one. Yes, dopamine yes. is the motivational do one. And if you're low on that, you're half asleep. Whereas most people are here and you're down here. And then there's a gunshot and everybody else goes, <gasps> and you go. Phew. So now you're the one running into the burning building. You're the first responder. You're the one who's, you know, okay, I've already jumped out of the airplane with a parachute. I'm going to jump out. You hand it to me in midair. Yeah, that's great. And, and so on. Uh, and when you see anybody in a career where it is high stress, high, high stimulation, I think is a term that's been used, uh, consider there's ADHD. And if you see someone who's celebrity in that field and they just crash and burn and you think, what were they thinking? 
Uh, my my argument is they weren't, and that's that's what's avoidable for me. Jeez. Anyway, is um you know obviously the current situation with the coronavirus and stuff. I mean, you know, have you have you been called to, or I mean, are there people that are first responders that you know? I mean, um, yeah, how much linkage is there as far as? Well, we have we have uh, we use Patreon, uh, which is this sponsoring thing. So we have, yeah, we, uh, I think, about three or four hundred patrons, uh, and every week since this started, we've been doing a live chat at least one a week, sometimes two. Um, and there are the you know the first responders and stuff. Um, there are a number of them who are a lot of the patrons are um, in those things, but they're out there responding. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, down the road, definitely. And so uh, it's been interesting because a lot of the people who are the groups that are the folks that are showing up for the, the chats and these interactions where it's a really a wonderful community. You've got a whole bunch of people who who get it uh, and have solutions or have problems that you can help with. But those people tend to be people who work from home. And I even I for the last decade really because I'm not out producing a lot of stuff. Uh, I'm mostly shooting in the house um, or go- shooting at a convention, uh, an ADHD gathering of some kind. Sure. So <laughs> I said to my wife, you know, the big, I even got my hair cut just in time. Like it's just, it's worked out for us. That said, you know, it's scary. I know, yeah. you know, when you have kids, you worry uh, and they're struggling, I think. And well, I know a lot of people are, so it's, um, uh, and it's funny, isn't it? Because uh, I, I was saying the other day to, uh, maybe it was to Mark, I said, you know, we, t- everybody trying to anticipate what would happen uh, in a disaster. And nobody's anticipating that a certain portion would say, I want to go outside and be eaten by the zombies, you know, or whatever it is. There's just yeah, yeah. Pe- people who aren't, and I get it, if your business is going under and things like that, for sure. But yeah. it's... Um, what was the other great phrase I heard, which was something like, stop saying this is the, stop posting pictures of empty streets and saying, this looks like the end of the world. What you're seeing here is actually love, compassion, self-sacrifice, caring. Yeah. That's why the streets are empty. Yes. Agreed. This is the best. If people were selfish and all of those things, and some are, uh, or are ignorant and some are, um, the streets would be full of people, but people are staying home. I don't think it's easy on anybody. It's probably harder on people with ADHD just because our mind is going. But, uh, you know, a couple have said to me, on the other hand, I'm never bored because I've always got stuff going on here. So, Well, and I, and I, I, I think, and I've, I, sadly, I've heard a few responses. You of, can do somehow. Oh, are you still with me? I can't hear you. Hang on. Can't hear me? I'm still, I haven't touched anything. Are you? I can hear you. Do you want me to wrap sure, up? we'll wrap it up. Okay. I, I know a lot of people are likely going to need your help when they're done with uh, this situation. And I'm glad you're out there. And I will certainly promote your website and everything that you're involved in. So uh, what an amazing career. Thank you for everything you've done. And um, I hope we can talk again sometime. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Really great to talk about it all. I had actually forgotten it all. I had no idea I did this show until you mentioned it. So. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thanks again, John. Take care uh, and uh, and have a good one. Stay safe. In fact, I would actually not sit on the couch. I'd be under it. Just get underneath and stay <laughs> stay low. <laughs> good. I'm going to write you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. That's Rick Green. Uh, man, go to his website and uh, check out his uh, work. Uh, He's a very funny man, but also his uh, incredible charity work that he's doing right now to uh, help people become more aware and treat ADHD. Check out Rick's website, Totally ADD, to get more information on what he's doing now. And I really hope he'll come back because, uh, as you could tell, I I didn't realize some of uh, Rick's incredible career. Uh, I knew him primarily from Prisoners of Gravity, and I really do hope he comes back because I'd love to talk to him more about uh, his his work, his public speaking, but also his uh, wonderful years 
and impact on Canadian comedy. Great stuff from Rick Green. Thanks a lot for listening today to Word Balloon. As I said earlier, uh, the companion uh, podcast today is a great conversation with Chip Zdarsky. I urge you to check that out as well. Great, fun conversation with Chip. And uh, looking forward to sharing that with you in just a few minutes to upload it along with today's episode with Rick. I'm also talking tonight, Word Balloon Live. It's uh, Shelly Bond today. I hope you uh, join us tonight at uh, 11 p.m. Eastern, 10 Central, 8 p.m. Pacific. It's going to be a really fun conversation. Shelley, the wonderful Vertigo editor, has uh, been doing a lot of other great projects as well and also trying to help out uh, some comic shop owners during the corona crisis. We talk about that, her uh, wonderful years at Vertigo. I keep learning more and more about Shelley. Uh, Mike Norton told me a very lovely story about how great of a person Shelley is. I'm not surprised to hear this. Uh, she's terrific. And she's a part of the League of Word Balloon listeners, uh, by the way, as uh, many of you are. And I thank you for your support, League, via Patreon, patreon.com slash word balloon. Uh, greatly appreciate it during this crazy unemployment time. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions. Copyright 2020. Stay happy, stay safe, stay healthy. <laughs>